The doctor watched the two halves of the ceremonial ribbon drift apart in the still, rare air, scissors still clutched in his right hand. From the wooden inauguration platform, he looked out across the dark and stony plain towards the building some two hundred metres in front of him. There were many differing designs, connected into a single complex by open-air paths and covered corridors. Various artificial light sources threw some areas into stark clarity while leaving others in mysterious shadow. Yet it was still plain enough that all these constructions were in pristine condition, brand new, like the platform, but with an aura of permanency. Above the Doctor and his companions was what seemed like a night sky, although the Doctor knew it was not. Across almost its entire expanse it was dotted with stars, galaxy and nebulae, as one might expect at night on any planet with a thin enough atmosphere. Just to the left of the buildings, a small way above the horizon, was a patch of sky that told the Doctor otherwise. A perfectly circular area, roughly double the diameter of Earth's moon when viewed from Earth, in which no stars could be seen. No fluke of stellar distribution, this, but the Schwarzschild radius of the planet's long-dead sun, a black hole. The surface of the planet seemed to echo the state of its dead companion, black and lifeless under the dim light of the stars. The Doctor knew, though, that these rocks were in fact of many shades of grey, silver and pink when exposed to stronger illumination, and that they concealed still more potential. Beneath their covering, huge tidal forces caused by the proximity of the black hole and the strengths of its gravitational field created vast amounts of geothermal energy. This in its turn was harnessed by the power generators supplying the buildings on the surface with all they would ever need. Also beneath the surface were vast caverns in which the atmospheric generation plants worked tirelessly to breathe life over this seemingly dead world. The Doctor felt oddly comforted by the thought that this sun and planet, both in the twilight of their lives, could still prove useful, providing a home and resting place for his knowledge and experience. He turned to his companions, all gathered upon the platform, and smiled. It's complete. The handful of individuals he was addressing were as wildly eclectic a bunch as you were ever likely to meet. Radreg, the Alshin, was vaguely human in proportions, but had limbs that were far thinner and more tubular than any man's. His head was supported on a similarly spindly neck and looked precariously balanced given its large size. It was about the size and shape of a large pumpkin, an impression strengthened still further by his wide, deep-set eyes and broad mouth. His skin was a mottled purple colour, and about his shoulders he wore a three-quarter length blue cloak. In his deep, near-monotonous voice, he responded to the Doctor. The Institute of Time, your dream, all our dreams, made reality. A place where those of us who wander may congregate to pool our knowledge, to discover all we can about our universe and hopefully build a better future. The Doctor acknowledged this with a nod. I can hardly believe it myself. I've dreamt about it for so long. Seeing it here makes me wonder if I'm still sleeping. The second of the Doctor's companions now chose to speak. The hive was enclosed in a hollow perspex cube, roughly one and a half foot along each side. This sat upon a motorised wheeled plinth, which supported the cube at about chest height. Small electrical control wires ran between the cube and the plinth. Within the cube buzzed the hive itself. One thousand red and black bee-like insects flew, walked and danced about, their actions all part of the thought processes of the collective mind of the hive. Occasionally, one or more of the bees would fly in or out of tiny circular air holes drilled in the cube. Radred looked particularly nervous when they approached him, his intellectual acceptance of the hive as a fellow time traveller and seeker after truth not entirely suppressing his instinctual aversion to flying, stinging insects. The hive spoke by means of a computerized voice synthesizer. And when, dear doctor, did you first come up with this idea? The doctor frowned, for the first time unsure of himself. You know, I'm not sure... I've been through so many regenerations it becomes difficult sometimes to pin things down. The memory starts to fade after the first thousand years. And even more so, he thought to himself, at the tail end of a regeneration. His failing memory was a further sign that his eighth life would soon be over. Two mechanical arms folded out from the hive's plinth and gesticulated, encouraging the doctor to continue. 
I have a feeling I've been carrying this idea around from when I first became isolated from the others of my race. A gentle hum filled the air, a pure note. This came from Hactrix, and was his habitual way of introducing himself before speaking. He was a solid, transparent, red tetrahedral crystal, about nine inches high. He hovered six feet above the ground, his thoughts alone manipulating the forces that allowed him to do so. In a similar way, he could use his own body as a speaker and produce a vast range of sounds simply by altering the speed and amplitude of oscillations of the atoms within his crystal lattice. The note he was currently producing was his own resonant frequency. How so? came the question as clear as a bell. The doctor shrugged. I'm not sure. Keen as I was to leave, I suppose I never really got over the loss of the company of so many like-minded individuals. I knew I'd never quite see eye to eye with them. We were always at odds with each other in terms of our methodology. In more recent years, I've come to consider that even I can't carry on indefinitely, that others should share in the task of exploring our universe. He tapped his head lightly. There are an awful lot of eggs stored in this one basket, you know. I fear, should the weave unravel, all I've ever seen shall be lost forever. A certain sense of foreboding has been plaguing me lately, along with increasing tiredness. I'm so far away now from my brethren. This last statement from the doctor seemed disjointed and distinctly wistful. He paused for a moment, looking downwards, his eyes glazed. Finally, he shook himself out of his reverie. I also thought that it might be nice to have somewhere to rest, to receive news of others' adventures and review them at my leisure. And so I began to think of other races I knew who also travelled through time, and in particular certain individuals within those races who had shown a keen interest in the universe and the pursuit of truth. As I met you in the course of my travels, over time as it were, I began to be more convinced that this institute could be made a reality. He paused for a moment. I'm still amazed, my friends. A chuckle went around the group as they congratulated one another. The two remaining members were the reptilian Com and the mobile, vaguely rosebush-like plant creature Risha. This small assembly, whose powers had rendered this idea in rock, steel and glass, were only the beginning, of course. They all hoped to add to their numbers over time as they encountered similarly-minded explorers. Well... Hactrix announced momentously. With our combined efforts, this institute should live up to its name and survive to the end of time. It's been built to last. The doctor raised an eyebrow in the merest suggestion of doubt, but he was forced to agree. I had that in mind, certainly, when I picked this planet as the foundation of our institute. Black holes are so much more stable than stars. None of this worrying about red giant phases or supernovae. People always assume there's no energy to be had from them either, simply for lack of that showy EM radiation, light and heat and the like. But our geothermal power station should drive the Institute and its systems for as long as we need them. Until the end of the universe. Risha rustled. The doctor frowned. Perhaps. The hive's synthetic laugh crackled forth. Why not? The Institute seems durable enough, and each of us is as long-lived as any life form is ever likely to be. In our own ways, we have all conquered our own mortality. There is no reason why we shouldn't see the whole of creation out. Radreg nodded and held up a hand, exclaiming, Of course. All senses turned to him. What is it? Com hissed. Radreg shook his great head, as if waking from a dream. But we're time travellers. Why don't we just go to the end of the universe and see if the Institute of Time still stands? There were excited murmurs at this suggestion, but once again the doctor was left frowning. "'What's the matter?' Hattrick asked, concerned. "'You don't seem to share our enthusiasm.' The doctor shook his head, straining to dredge up some long-forgotten memory. "'It's no good,' he said with an exasperation. "'I can't remember why.' "'Why what?' Hattrick responded. The doctor smiled apologetically. "'Okay, sorry, I'll explain.' There was a rule among the Time Lords that we mustn't travel beyond a certain future time. I remember the rule, and I remember the time, but I can't for the life of me remember why. Still, it would seem prudent for us to abide by this rule. I'm sure there must be a good reason for it. The disappointment was evident amongst all those gathered there. It was as if a charge which had hung in the air about them had suddenly dispersed, run to earth. The Doctor, however, had not changed from his state of thoughtful introspection. 
There might be a way, though, he said slowly, the idea not yet fully coalesced within his mind. Excitement returned to the group. All leaned forward to hear what he had to say. The doctor suddenly grinned at them and winked. If I were to take the TARDIS to the moment before that time, then the natural passage of time would take me beyond it, and I could see what was there without breaking the rule. Radarek clapped his hands. Bravo, Doctor. An excellent suggestion. Will you do this? Hattrix asked eagerly. Will you make this journey and report back to us? There might be dangers. The Doctor continued to grin. There are always dangers. We are, after all, travellers in time. We face dangers every day in our explorations. Yes, I'll do it and report back to you with my findings. This might form a fitting coda to my active explorations. Who knows? At these words there were applause and other various species-specific signals of admiration, the doctor acknowledging these with an inclination of his head. This is a fine inaugural adventure for our institute, Hattrix exclaimed. Go with our good wishes and return safely to us, your friends. With this final blessing received, the doctor waved and turned towards his TARDIS, standing on the rocky plain some ten yards away, surrounded by the vehicles of his companions. He stood for a moment in the doorway, and turned back to look at his gathered friends, all still watching with anticipation. He waved once more, then went inside. The interior of the TARDIS was dark and vaulted like some vast cathedral to technology, and as the doctor walked across the marble floor, his footfalls echoed back to him from a hundred different surfaces. He passed his comfortable chair and his bookshelves, passed within the stone pillars surrounding the main console, until he stood before it, cast-iron supports looming over him gloomily. He set the temporal coordinates to one second before that fateful forbidden date. With a flick of a single lever, the central column began to rise and fall rhythmically, pushing the doctor and his ship through time. It did not take long before the column ceased its movement and the doctor realised that they had landed. He felt something of a sense of anticlimax. The journey had been so swift. Nothing unexpected had happened. It hardly felt as if he was standing on the edge of an unknown territory, moving into unknown time. He shook himself free of the mood and checked the environment outside the TARDIS. It was apparently safe enough, so he decided to step outside and explore. As the doctor stepped from the TARDIS, the first thing he noticed was the air. While still perfectly breathable, it seemed a little thinner than when he had left. He wondered if there might be some minor problems with the atmospheric generation plants. He would check later. The next thing to strike the Doctor was the Institute of Time itself. It was by and large intact, but showing signs of wear and tear. Some of the artificial lights had failed and not been replaced. Here and there he could see cracks in the walls and the odd broken pane of glass. Also, he noticed something else growing around the bases of many of the working lampposts. Plants, huddled in these pools of light, plants of the type that grew in the underground atmospheric generation caverns. They should not have been allowed to spread to here. The Institute was showing every sign of neglect. The Doctor had by now begun to walk towards the buildings, but suddenly froze in his tracks, looking upwards in horror. He cast his eyes about in all directions, searching the sky from horizon to horizon, but all was in vain. There was nothing to be seen, not a star, galaxy or nebula, total blackness. For a moment he panicked, thinking the planet had wandered much closer to the black hole's event horizon over the intervening millennia. Then he calmed himself, as he realised that if the planet were that close, it would have been pulled apart by the intolerable tidal forces long ago. This knowledge did nothing, however, to answer the fundamental question that was bothering him. What had happened here? He resolved to find the answer, and to that end set off once more towards the complex. The nearest laboratory was Radrake's, and so the doctor entered, hoping to find his friend there. He passed down the entrance corridor, looking in at empty dust-covered storerooms and offices on the way. Finally, he pushed through the double doors at the end into the main lab. The room was dark, a dim light from the corridor only illuminating a few metres of floor. The doctor found a light switch and pushed it. A dim disc flickered on above the centre of the lab, offering its feeble illumination to the whole room. When the doctor had last seen the lab, it had been newly built and was as yet unused. Now it had clearly been utilised, old equipment had been replaced, new and unrecognised experiments constructed. 
but all this must have happened a long time ago. Like other rooms he had observed, everything was now covered in a thick layer of dust. Then the doctor noticed something beyond the main workbench, incongruous by its simplicity and apparent lack of purpose. It was a short length of cord hanging from the ceiling. At its end there was a tiny loop, maybe an inch and a half in diameter. The doctor walked around the edge of the workbench to get a closer look and almost stumbled over a small collection of objects on the floor. His foot had nudged against a large round sphere and he immediately dropped to the floor to examine it more closely. The sphere was grey and sat amongst a pile of thin tubes of various lengths and shapes, all of a similar colour. Something nagged at the back of the doctor's mind, but he could not quite put the pieces together. He turned the sphere around in his hand and stared into empty eye sockets. In one moment of horror, those pieces came together in his mind to form the image of his friend Radrag. The skull, staring up at him with two black holes and a broad toothy grin, had now, more than ever, the appearance of some Halloween lantern, death's grim humour. Tears filled the doctor's eyes. How? he asked his dead friend. How did it come to this? Then another object caught the doctor's eye. Beyond the pile of bones lay a stool, on its side where it had been kicked countless years before. The doctor's eyes widened as realisation struck him. Looking up once more at the cord and loop, he saw it now for what it was. It was a noose. Radreg had hung himself. The question within the doctor's mind was no longer how, but why. Why had his rational, sensible friend chosen to take his own life? It seemed so arbitrary, without reason, so unlike Radreg. He gently placed his friend's skull back upon the floor and stood up. He steeled himself and set out for the next of his friend's research areas, Hactrix, the Red Crystal. There was an open-air path between the two laboratories, and it was this that the doctor now took. Partway along, as he passed beneath one of the overhanging lamps, he tripped. Looking down, he saw a plant had forced a large crack in the pavement, and this had caught his foot. With an ancient Gallifreyan obscenity, he cursed the lack of care given to the maintenance of his institute, but then realised that what was truly playing on his mind was fear over the fate of his friends. He hurried on, taking more care over both his footfalls and his outbursts. Hactrick's section of the institute was an odd building. Externally, it resembled nothing so much as a miniature mountain, while its corridors were like the channels formed by old magma flows. His lab, however, showed the other side to the crystal being. Even newly built, he had already filled it with a variety of flora, being fascinated with organic life, and in particular vegetation, perhaps because of its difference from his own manner of existence. Now, as the doctor entered the still-lit lab, he could see that at least this much of Hactress had survived, his obsession having taken over much of his work area. Creepers ran everywhere, while the floor was thick with a multitude of different species of plant. As he walked through them, he could feel a significant level of compost under his feet. These plants had clearly grown unchallenged for some time. He brushed vines aside as he made his way around the laboratory, looking for any signs of his old friend. Then he saw a glint of red from a desk set against the rocky far wall. The flora grasped at every limb as he tore his way towards this hint of his friend's continued presence. When he reached the desk, his hopes were shattered. Shards of red crystal lay strewn across the desk. On either side of this area of destruction sat two speakers, wired to a now lifeless signal generator. The doctor could not quite fathom what had gone on here. The signal generator had been running from a battery pack, but one which had no external power switch. He recognised it as a type that only responded to the thoughts of Hactrix. Clearly it had been allowed to run until drained. Desperate now for answers, the doctor disconnected the signal generator from the now dead cell and connected it instead to the main supply, hoping that this, like the light, still functioned. He was rewarded by a crackle from the speakers followed by a long, loud, pure note. It took a little time for the doctor to register the significance of the sound. It was Hactrick's resonant frequency, the note with which he began any conversation. 
The sound continued, and with it a realization dawned within the doctor's harrowed mind. Hactrix, like Radrech, had committed suicide. He had set up the equipment to cause his own crystal lattice to vibrate at its resonant frequency, the speakers driving this oscillation to ever greater amplitudes and until ultimately he had been shaken apart, splintered. The doctor switched off the machine and stared at the remnants of his colleague. His head snapped up and he stared grimly into the distance momentarily before turning and pushing his way past the plants to leave the lab. He strode briskly down the corridors until they changed from the natural-looking tunnels to more conventional corridors. He burst now into the workroom of the hive and immediately saw the Perspex cube supported on its pedestal. He instantly knew something was amiss. It was terribly still. Running to it, the doctor grabbed its sides in a desperate frenzy and stared wildly at the devastation within. Thousands of desiccated husks littered the floor of the cube. The hive had been extinguished some time ago. The doctor cried out in anguish against the silent walls of the Institute. Would no one tell him why his friends were dead? He noticed now small objects stuffed into every air hole of the hive's container. They were small brown tubes singed at one end. Looking down at the floor, the doctor saw a small packet lying discarded there. He picked it up and brushed the dust from its surface. A blaze of red was revealed, along with the legend... Marlborough. The doctor stood amazed. The hive had asphyxiated itself. He felt a pang of guilt as he realized he must have left them in the Institute himself, part of his own collection of artifacts. No one else here shared his passion for the planet of their origin. The doctor now dashed with ever-increasing trepidation towards his next goal. As he entered Comm's research base, he was struck by a blast of chill air. The air conditioning was turned up to full, and as the doctor had already suspected, Com's cold, still body lay upon the icy ground. With no internal means of regulating his body temperature, the gentle reptilian scientist had frozen to death. The doctor fled, crashing through doors, heedless of anyone or anything. He held no hope now for any of his friends, but felt compelled to discover the fate of them all. He bowled through the doors of Risha's lab and was blinded by the light within. It took a few seconds for his eyes to adjust to the higher intensity illumination, but when they finally did, he cried with joy at the sight before him. Risha had not merely survived, but thrived. She now covered every surface of her laboratory, leaves and flowers as far as the eye could see, rampant, vibrant growth. Risha! the doctor cried. What's happened? Why are the others dead? There was no answer. Indeed, nothing stirred amongst all this living vegetation. The doctor bent down and gently stroked the nearest beautiful flower. Risha? The silence was appalling. The doctor felt an urge to scream rise within him. Anything rather than suffer this deathly stillness. The feeling passed to be replaced by memories of lively debates the doctor and Risha had had together. Other recollections now sprang to mind. She had always been so fastidious about her pruning, never allowing her size to vary by more than a few centimetres. The doctor recalled her explanation. If I were to cut myself back too far, she had whispered, I'd not be able to maintain my energy levels, and my thoughts would die away, starved of food. But, the doctor had asked, why not allow yourself to grow larger? Surely this would allow you greater energy and greater scope for creative thought. Risha had shaken her flowers wildly, her kind of laughter. Unfortunately not, my doctor. If I allow my body to grow too far beyond its current size, my thoughts would become too diffuse and unconnected, spread too thin among my shoots. They would eventually lose all cohesion, and my consciousness would fade and die never to be recovered. The doctor looked at the wild and uncontrolled life around him and realised he was looking at a grave. Other memories seemed stirred by Risha's sprawling senility and death, but refused to reveal themselves to him. He ran once more, searching but without purpose or direction, 
stumbling across still more bodies now unknown to him, friends no doubt he had yet to make. He wondered bitterly if it would not be better for them if he never met them, and guilt joined grief to sit heavily upon his mind. And in this dark mood the ultimate in morbidity overcame him. He dashed towards his own laboratory within the Institute, fearing what he might discover, and yet in part feeling he would welcome the knowledge that place might bring, however terminal. He threw back the doors and looked around. The bookshelves and benches were much as he had left them. One or two new trinkets were scattered here and there, but most were familiar to him. On the far side of the room, another of his hide-backed leather armchairs was turned almost entirely away from him, facing towards the dead fireplace. His heart skipped a beat. Barely visible, he could just make out a figure's arm resting on the arm of the chair. It did not move, and looked as dusty and ancient as everything else in this accursed place. Slowly, gripped by fear, the doctor crept towards the chair. He paused just behind it, his feet refusing to obey his mind. Then, steeling himself for this final effort, he leapt around the seat to face its sepulchral occupant. The doctor's face, which had been wearing an expression of horror initially, now changed to one of surprise, followed by anger. You! he cried indignantly. The occupant of the chair looked up sharply, brushed the dust from his jacket. He smoothed his straight white hair, swept back from his temples. Yes, me, he said. Or perhaps I should say you. The doctor ran his own hands over his wavy brown hair, unconsciously mimicking the actions of the man before him. What the hell are you doing here? he asked accusingly. Oh, come now, the doctor said, gently admonishing himself. Where else would I be at this time? Are you responsible for all this? the doctor asked, gesturing around him with his hands. The first doctor smiled. Oh, I think we share whatever responsibility we have in equal measure. The doctor gave a gasp of exasperation. Frustrated by the first doctor's elliptical responses, he decided to be more direct. Why are you here? he asked bluntly. To remind myself of one or two things. What happened to my friends? Ah, yes, your exciting new friends. I suppose they're not as exciting and new anymore, hmm? How can you be so callous? The doctor exploded. You're so careless of those people's lives. I've always hated you. You're so dispassionate. Self-hatred, the first doctor responded. That can hardly be healthy. And when did I become so emotional, so unruly in my thoughts? Is this perhaps some form of senility, dementia? You're a fine one to talk of senility, you decrepit, dried-up old husk, the doctor responded savagely. The first doctor tutted. I'd hoped I'd never become so superficial. You know full well that you are the aged one. The doctor shook his head. You're sidetracking me. I want to know what happened to my friends. Tell me. The first doctor held up his hands. Wait, be patient. Allow me to do what I came here to do, and all will become clear. The doctor subsided and waited for his earlier incarnation to continue. You remember, it seems, the rule forbidding travel beyond a certain point in time. The doctor nodded. Well, continued the first doctor, it seems, as I thought I might, that you've forgotten the reason for it. The doctor frowned, but did not deny this. The first doctor elaborated some more. There are two very good reasons for this, and both have contributed ultimately to the fate of your friends. The first reason should be obvious to you. Didn't you look up before you came in? Yes, the doctor responded cautiously. And why do you think the sky is totally black and featureless? The doctor thought for a moment before remembering his universal evolution. The universe is in heat death. All the stars have become black holes or brown dwarfs, and the energy of the universe has become totally diffuse. In fact, I guess every system in the universe has become totally isolated from every other, each passing beyond the visible horizon of the others. Indeed, further in the future than here, I guess even the remaining matter will break down into its most fundamental components. This is due to the continual expansion, yes? The first doctor gave a subdued round of applause. 
Well done. It's nice to see my many regenerations haven't rattled every piece of useful information out of your head. Why, thank you, the doctor responded sarcastically. But you've obviously not considered the effect that this had on the population of the universe. Firstly, and purely physically, it has wiped out most races, killed as their sons died, and robbed of anywhere to run. Well, yes, the doctor conceded. That is fairly obvious. I thought so, the first doctor agreed. But the second effect is more subtle, as it is psychological. The effect of living on one planet, isolated from all others, is ultimately stifling. Those races clever enough to harness the power of black holes as you did, still finally lack stimulation. In the end, their numbers dwindled as their drive to procreate waned, their impetus to continue removed. In effect, all the races of the universe are committing suicide as we speak, if they have not done so already. By the way, didn't you wonder how I found this place? The doctor was knocked off balance by this sudden change of tack. Uh, well, yes. The first doctor smiled in a way finely calculated to create maximum annoyance in the doctor. Well, it was my idea, the Institute of Time. If I ever found the time, this is where I was going to build it. So, no matter what else I might have forgotten, this seemed the most likely place to look in the event I started irresponsibly bending the rules of time travel. The doctor frowned with irritation. I don't remember ever being that much of a conformist. The first doctor raised an eyebrow. There is a difference between being a non-conformist and a reckless anarchist. The doctor dismissed the first doctor's response with a wave of his hand. Enough of this. I don't see how your explanation for the rest of the universe applies to my friends. They're all time travellers, after all. While they might not be able to usefully travel conventionally through space at this point in time, there's no reason why they couldn't travel back, then laterally through space, and forward to any temporal location. The first doctor nodded. Quite true. But your friends always had an eye to the future. And this brings me to the second and more fundamental reason you're not meant to travel past this point in time. Go on, the doctor said. If you go much further forward in time, the expansion of the universe is such that the total energy of the universe is stretched to a critical point, the point of maximum entropy. At this point, there is a slipping or shift in the speed of light, a decrease, in fact. The doctor's eyes widened as he realised the implications of this, which results in an enormous release of energy, another big bang, the creation of a whole new universe, a whole new realm to explore. Oh, and of course, it allows for the faster-than-light expansion of the first few moments. Very neat. The first doctor did not respond for a few seconds and simply studied the doctor intently. Finally, he spoke. And the destruction of this universe, much as the universe before this one died to create our own. Exceedingly neat. If you were to travel much further forward from this point, you would cease to be, because space and time, the universe in which you exist, would cease to be. But... The doctor began. And this, the first doctor interrupted, is what your friends finally realised. A whole, whole new universe was there to be explored, but, by definition, they would always be apart from it. The rules governing the universe, governing space and time, are tied to the speed of light, through the background energy of the universe. If that changes, then those rules change. Any universe following those obsolete rules therefore ceases to exist, which would include, of course, any constituent part of it. That would also cover you and your friends. They were caught by this knowledge of their limitations, trapped in a depressive obsession with what they could not have. That is what drove them to end their lives, as they could see no future ahead of them, no point to their continuation. The doctor shook his head slowly, then sank to sit cross-legged on the floor, his forehead resting on his right hand. So this is it. The end. Nothing to look forward to. Worse than that, a, a glimpse, a, a vision of what might be that can never be realised. A whole new universe denied to me. Worse still, an infinity of universes denied to me. All that has gone before this universe of ours, all that will follow it, all is barred to me. I can see why my friends ended here. I understand them completely. The first doctor rose from his chair, frowning, and stood over the doctor. 
I realise you're upset over the death of your friends, he said, but there is no reason at all why you should share their fate. The doctor did not seem to be listening to him. He was lost in a state of hopelessness, much as his friends had been. Look at me, the first doctor snapped. The doctor's head lifted to meet his gaze. Your friends, the first doctor continued, for all that they were time travellers, were linear in their thoughts, pedestrian. This is the real reason I'm here, to remind you how to live. To show me how much better I am than them, the doctor snarled bitterly. For the first time, the first doctor seemed to soften his demeanour. When he answered, it was almost apologetic. I didn't mean to sound so condescending or judgmental over your friends. However, there is something different to our nature, something that should be obvious, even innate to our way of thinking. He paused, ensuring that he had the doctor's full attention before continuing. Your friends perceive time as a line, running from past to present, and then to the future. They tied their lives to that line like sailors adrift in an ocean, tied to a broken mast. Once they saw how that line ended, they perceived this naturally as an end of their lives also. But that is not how we exist, you and I. How arrogant of your friends to assume that simply because they had seen the demise of the universe, they understood it in its totality. Why, we could journey throughout its temporal and spatial borders for a billion years, and still our experiences would be insignificant when compared with what remained undiscovered. Our timeline, your timeline, your future, stretches before you with an infinity of possibilities. We wander back and forth in time and space while our life heads ever onwards. Your personal timeline is the reason for our existence, and it will continue for as long as you have the stomach for new experiences and new adventures. The doctor rose to his feet and studied his earlier self. He wondered then whether age truly brought wisdom, or if, at least in his case, it simply eroded it. He reached out his left hand to grasp the first doctor's shoulder. Thank you, he said, tired but resolute for reminding me. The first doctor smiled once again. Any time. Five time travellers had watched the TARDIS wink out of existence only a moment earlier. Now with a familiar, pulsing whine, it reappeared in exactly the same spot. They rushed over to meet the doctor as he stepped from the machine, all clamouring for attention. The doctor patted the air in front of him, trying to restore some semblance of calm. Did you do it? Did you make it beyond the forbidden time? Radrick asked with uncharacteristic excitement. The doctor saw he was not going to be able to say nothing, and so replied, Yes, yes, I did. Well? asked Hactrix. Well, what? the doctor responded innocently. Will the Institute of Time, will we all, last to the end of time? The doctor covered any sadness he might have felt with a careless, dismissive manner. Oh, come on. You don't want me to tell you everything right now, do you? The frustration was evident from each of his friends, but their attitudes also remained good-natured towards him. After all, he said, looking at each of them in turn, we have all the time in the world. <laughs>